Well, we were talking about uh, Luke 6, and uh, as Jesus is calling together uh, his 12 apostles out of the group of disciples, uh, it's kind of a, um, an unusual passage to, to try to break down, but there are some principles that we can see from it, even though it's only, only five verses that we're talking about. Um, so as we have been going through it, uh, if anybody was with us uh, for our earlier podcast on this topic. Somebody uh, was. Somebody must have been. <laughs> My mom probably was. Um, as we were going through it, even though it's just a short little piece, we were looking at the fact that Jesus doesn't um, doesn't need a team. He's God, right? And right. he's already demonstrated throughout the first five and a half chapters that he's got authority over the physical and spiritual realms. He can do essentially anything that he wants. Uh, essentially, you know, it isn't even necessary. Just anything that he wants, right. he's, he's got. And so uh, he's not picking this team because he couldn't uh, do anything else. He's picking this team because he decides this is what what he wants. This right. is God's sovereign you gotta choice. Have <laughs> so as he's choosing it, it's interesting also that um, he's choosing a bunch of guys that that. Probably, if you were going to do a leadership seminar, you would not instruct people, hey, this is the team that you would pick if you want to change the right. world. Um, and so it becomes kind of clear that, first off, he doesn't need them. He chooses to have them. He doesn't choose them based on their abilities or their talents, but based on God's sovereign election in this process. And it also becomes extremely clear that, um, just as we see throughout the rest of Scripture's, God is very, very into relationship. God, right. God values, he prizes um, relationship and teamwork. And uh, we see that even in the creation account, as he says, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll create a helper suitable for him. And so uh, creates man and woman, male and female. And in, in this, um, this synergistic relationship, uh, the two become more than they could be uh, individually. And I think that's something that Jesus is, is demonstrating for us here as well. He chooses out of all of his disciples, he chooses 12. It seems like a real stretch to think that these were the 12 most gifted people or sure. even perhaps the most faithful people. Um, and now we're not told one way or another, but looking at what we see from these guys throughout the stories that we see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, faithfulness is not exactly something that they do really well, particularly if you're talking about Judas, you right. know, for example. So Jesus clearly knows that Judas is going to betray him. Spoiler the, alert. Know, he's spending his time you know, before this uh, in prayer, seeking God's wisdom, seeking the Father's wisdom, and um, he knows the prophecies already, and God chooses Judas for this. Hmm. It can't be because of what Judas is bringing to the table. Right. He's doing this not for his benefit, but for God's glory. Right. Uh, and that tells us a lot about how God sees relationships. So, when when Jesus is choosing these these twelve, it's what is it based off of then? If not their faith, if not their skills or their what they're necessarily bringing to the table i mean when we choose our own relationships i mean it's it's often done i think on selfish terms at least to start sure. at least to start with right yeah what can this person bring to my life what yeah can this, you know so well, e even when we're talking about whether you know if we're talking about friendships we're looking at right. things that we have in common right that, that you know you remind me of myself right and obviously ways. these men are followers of, of jesus right. but why these particular individual that is a great question <laughs> and the only real answer that that i would have for that is that it's god's sovereign choice and so if we look at how god chose israel he goes mm -hmm. out of his way to say he didn't do this because israel was strong or rich or powerful or great or virtuous right i did this for my own glory because i'm god and i made this choice so when i found you you were nothing and i raised you up and made you great because you're mine uh and he never explains he never uh, he never said his answer is always because i'm god this right. is my choice so he doesn't ever go through and say well you know i knew that you'd respond to me so right. well in fact israel does just about the opposite if you could have a picture 
of how to disappoint the one who loves you the nation of Israel would be the greatest picture of that next to me. I, I think I'm just the perfect picture of that as well because God chooses us and then we continue to do our own thing instead of his thing. Israel's constantly unfaithful, constantly forgetting about God. And the more he blesses them, the more they forget him. And I look in the mirror and I see Israel. I see that same picture. He, he blesses me. And yet I get caught up in all of the things of this world and my own flesh and, and the, the whispers of the devil. And I get distracted and deprioritize mm -hmm. the only thing that matters being my relationship with, with Christ. So the idea that God chose them because of what they could offer it doesn't fit with anything else that we see. The idea that God chose them because they would respond doesn't fit with anything else that we see. And in Romans chapter 9, um, Paul's speaking of his choosing of Israel. It's interesting, you know, at one point later on, Jesus says to these guys, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Mm -hmm. Well, in, um, in Romans chapter 9, uh, he talks about, his choosing of Israel, his choosing of the saints. Now that that God, based only on his own sovereign election, chooses who will follow him. Now that becomes controversial. It shouldn't be because it's in the scripture. You can read it in black and white. But how that shakes out on God's side of the curtain, people debate a lot. And so for centuries now, um, folks have uh, drawn battle lines, sad to say, uh, between what is commonly known as Calvinist or Reformed theology and Arminian, or, or some folks would, would lump that in as holiness theology. Like there's a pre-selection Right, thing. so you talk about the fact that God has sovereignly chosen us, because we can't, get escape, can't escape that, but uh, we talk uh, in terms of God chooses because he knows that we'll respond, you know, things okay. like that. Uh, but again, that doesn't fit the picture. It doesn't fit what we see. And it truly doesn't, fit, aside from the scripture itself, it doesn't even fit our experience. Because if there were anything that I could do to blow this, I would blow it. This has everything to do well, with these him. these men blew it. A lot of Absolutely. them, you know. <laughs> and Israel is a picture of that. So again, Romans 9, uh, Paul is going through and, and um, breaking this down, related first to Israel, and then he extends that into the the saints and even starting like in verse 14 he's been talking about this through the whole thing but he says what shall we say then is god unjust not at all for he says to moses i'll have mercy on whom i have mercy i'll have compassion on whom i have com have compassion he's just talked about the difference between jacob and esau and that god chose them chose jacob and rejected esau before they were even born before either mm -hmm. one of them had done good or bad um and then in verse 16, it says, It does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. And then he gives a picture of Pharaoh being raised up specifically for God's glory, uh, even though he was being raised up in rejecting God. Uh, but it was so that God's glory would would be manifest. And he says, One of you will say to me, this is verse 19, One of you will say to me, Then why does God still blame us? For who resists his will? But who are you, O man, to talk back to God? This is exactly what God says to, to Job in, in his story. Uh, Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, Why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? And he goes on to say, What if God did all of these other things? What if all of the unsaved people, unchosen people of the world, if I could use that term, uh, what if all of them exist just so that you can see God? If, if that's the reason, then are you saying God's wrong? He's still God. So if God chooses to do it, it's the right thing. Now we're getting into a bigger, broader picture right. than, than what... But I almost think that the 12 here is a small picture of that. Absolutely a, is. You know? Yeah, we see um, God revealing his character over and over in the little scenes right. as well as the bigger overarching stories. And so all along the way, we see these pictures. And, and what, we, what we can recognize as a universal truth is that God chooses us not based on what we bring to God, but on his sovereign choice because he is God and he's able to do that and he doesn't have to explain to anyone. But one of the things, one of the characteristics that we see that's so dramatically different than us is God doesn't choose based on all these external principles. So we look at 
uh, how a person behaves or mm -hmm. looks or their background or their financial portfolio or um, you know whether they um, you know whether they're faithful in in their deportment and God isn't choosing based on that interestingly every one of the heroes that we see in scripture every one of them without without exception um, save Jesus who is uh, he is the you know the God man, so mm -hmm. he's uh, in a different category, so to speak. Every other fully human, non-God uh, hero in Scripture uh, comes with what a what a literary person would call a fatal flaw, or sure. many. So we see these constant sins and rejections of God and failings, and God never shies away from that. And I think it's. Uh, big names. Oh yeah, I'll pick a name. <laughs> Moses, All Noah, everybody. Right, the, and, and big sins. Right. You know, David committed adultery and then right. murdered a dude to cover up for it, or orchestrated a murder to, to cover up for it. So you're talking about big things that God doesn't shy away from. Mm -hmm. He knows these things going in and still chooses them. So again, a picture of God's sovereignty in what He's doing, and He doesn't have to explain. That's one of the things that I think He makes the Book of Job such a prominent theme for everything else is that God does what God does and has no need to explain it to us. Well, and we're so quick to judge everything and everyone, you know. Including I, God. Right. And we just don't know. Right. We don't know who he, cho who he chooses, why he chooses, what he chooses, but it's on him and not us. We can make our own assumptions, and I'm totally guilty of that. I do it all the time. You know, you, you automatically think, yeah, we all do. oh, Charles Manson's going to hell. Right. But who do, what do I know about Charles Manson right. and what, you know, or, or anybody? What do I know about Judas other than, you know, I don't know what God is, is saying or doing or thinking. Right. We see in part God sees the whole. He sees right. everything, and, and he, knows, uh, he knows what's true. There, there are a lot. I was just speaking with someone this morning before we came in that um, we don't know what other people are going through. We don't know right. what what baggage they have in their mind. Even when we think we do, we don't. Well, and that assumption is dangerous. It really is, and and we don't know. You know, when when someone comes and confesses Christ or is baptized, we we can. Um, we can rightly judge by their fruits and so on, right. you know. But ultimately, we still only know in part. Right. God knows those one who way are or his, another, and we don't. Whether it's good or bad, right? We don't know, um, but God does. So as we're as we're seeing this, how how can we apply this to our own everyday life? When, and you know, if that's what we're here to do, is to to bring the reality of God to bear on the realities of everyday life and, and what we're going through. Um, you know, Luke is setting the stage here. This is this is the final um, stage setting context that he's giving as we get into the the beginning of Christ's earthly ministry in earnest. So it's already begun, and we've kind of walked through these the the early innings now, right? So we're getting to getting into the sports references. <laughs> we're getting to the 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 you know the rubber meeting the road. Uh, we've set up the the conflict that's continuing to increase between Jesus and the religious leaders, uh, which is all on their end because it's Jesus is doing his own he's thing. He's just moving, right? Um, and so he he gives us this roster and he tells us who's here, who's you know who's on the team, so to speak. Uh, but with each one of these guys, there are different different backgrounds, different natures, um, and I think as we're trying to look at okay what what does this particular passage say to me today uh, i think one of the things that that you talked about is a big part of it don't judge based on the outside you know just like you know even the prophet uh samuel looked at david and, and all of david's brothers and all of them looked the part of king more than he did mm -hmm. and the lord says nope not not them this one you know you guys all see the outside I see the inside. Right. And, and ultimately, even that, I mean, that's a lesson for us, but God can choose whom he chooses. And, right. and that's how it works. So not judging others, big, big lesson. I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think the, the idea that God values diversity, mm -hmm. that God values, first and foremost, God values relationships. He values teamwork. 
Um, so just because I can do something as a solo act doesn't mm-hmm. mean I should. Uh, and you and I both have, have laughed a lot of times over, you know, <laughs> my wife is another one who is not a fan of group projects in school. You know, the idea that my grade is based on these other people Hate and so on. It. Hate it. Um, and, you know, the... The one, usually you have the one person who carries the load and right. everybody else is along for the ride. Well, is there a bigger <laughs> picture of that than what we're seeing here? Jesus right. is doing all of it. And as he's doing it, this is about him teaching these guys. Right. And teaching us. Not because they're going to do a better job or that Jesus is going to be more effective using them than not using them. He's He's God. I don't think I can emphasize that enough. If if the Heavenly Father had said, I just want to figuratively snap my fingers and everybody's going to be saved, he could do that. Right. But he chose not to for a, a reasons that we couldn't even begin to scratch the surface of because we're not him. And we certainly couldn't do that in a I think that's podcast. the underlying theme here. We're not him. That, I think that's the underlying <laughs> theme of reality. Right. You know, we, you, know you watch... I watch a lot of superhero movies, obviously. For anybody who knows me, that's not hard to figure out. Um, partly because I'm an American guy. So, uh, anyway, as we're going through. There's a steak right here. All of the. <laughs> don't tease me. Uh, as we're going through all of these these ideas of, you know, like the superhero movies, and, and we, all heroic tales have some basic elements that reflect the inbred nature of God that God has put into us right. because we're created in his image. And so that's innate to these tales. But when we see, in particular, I think superhero movies, science fiction movies, uh, the major epics of, of history, there is we're trying to capture something of God, and we so often miss it because the underlying theme is that he's God, we're not. Mm-hmm. When you look at at Greek and Roman mythology. They're trying to get this picture. And there's a partial uh, truth to whatever. that. Right. Yeah. So you get little pieces of God. Tribal religions get little pieces of God that you can observe in nature and you can draw conclusions That's from. That's why it's called mythology. But they don't get the full picture. Right. So again, we're getting getting beyond this idea. God is God. Is God. We're not. But in this passage, we see that God values relationships and teamwork and diversity in these things. So God isn't saying... Yeah, he's not choosing a bunch of priests to, you know... Right. you got some that are educated, some that are right. uneducated, some that are blue-collar workers, some that are politicians. Right. you got a, a, a religious zealot, uh, um, or really a political, it's blended together, a religious and political zealot, a dissident, so to speak. Wow, wouldn't that be great a group if, of terrorists. If, if that many diverse people could get in a group today and get along? <laughs> right. And obviously they didn't always get along, right. but at times they did. So right. you've got you know, financially minded people, you've got relationally minded people, uh, people that would never talk to each other in any other setting. You know, all these guys would have hated Matthew. He's a tax collector. They, they hated these guys. And now they're teammates. Now they're brought together in Christ. And none of the rest of that stuff matters. Only Christ matters. And that's what he says in Galatians 5, that, you know, in Christ, there's no, there's no slave or free or, or male or female. We're one in him. Our value is equal before God anyway. But now we're united as a family in him. So, you know, we're going to be doing the Civil War Days uh, reenactment thing. We're going to... Uh, Way to tie that. <laughs> we're going to participate in... in uh, uh, the church service for that, and I'm excited about it. A little bit nervous because I've never done a Civil War style service, so we do our best to, to to try to be true to that. I wonder what'll happen. <laughs> <laughs> but but as we're um, as we're doing it, the gospel is the gospel. Right. That's never changed. And it was the same in the 1800s. It, it, that's right. And so in the in the 1800s, when we were distorting it greatly, and people on both sides of this great war were using the scriptures to justify their positions, uh, in many cases they were partially right, but dramatically wrong mm-hmm. in, in where they're approaching it. And we do the same thing today. So we, we need to get to a place of understanding one another from God's perspective, the way God recognizes right. us. He's the only one who really knows. He created us. And so in Christ, there is no... 
there's no uh, strata here. In, there's, there are no, there's, there's no, no different. Yankee and Confederate. <laughs> no, there's no black and white and educated and uneducated. Uh, it's just, are you in Christ or are you not? I think that's a huge takeaway, you know, for for people who profess Christianity or just profess to be Christ followers, because that's so shockingly absent today yeah. that if I disagree with you on something or if I have a different political view or, or whatever, we can't get along. We can't right. even have a conversation. People who are hardcore Christians are saying this. Yeah. I even think it sometimes, oh, that person's a, a so-and-so, so I, you know, I, 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 we must have totally different views on right. everything. Yeah. So I just kind of avoid interacting with them. And, and, they, and people do the same thing with me, I'm sure. And that's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I mean, I think this is a wonderful picture of how things are supposed to be. Yeah, I think it's also important for us to recognize that you know, we're, we're reading this in the Bible itself. This right. isn't a new teaching. Right. It's not something that, that developed, you know, post-civil rights movement. Right. It's not something that came up in the 60s or, or anything like that. This is the heart of God from long before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. God has always had this. The Bible teaches only one race, the human race. Right. So there is no difference. All of those differences are things that we've put on right. as sin increased and separated us. There we've are created new ones. There are no. <laughs> let me say there are no difference in values. There's right. a tremendous difference in culture, in ethnicity. There are lots of difference differences, and and we need to learn to value those because God paints with all of the colors. He, he's got a very <laughs> nice, it, 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 he created it. So, it, you know, he's got this broad palette and, and we tend to keep things muted and anything that might have a splash of color in you the painting, we it. run away from right. it for sure. And, and we're offended by noticing the differences. Yeah. But how can we have a masterpiece without using a variety of different colors and a variety of different strokes? God does these things, and he doesn't ask or apologize. And we need to reflect his love through those relationships that he gives us. Agreed. Well, I think we'll end there for today. If you are in the Three Oaks, uh, Michigan area this weekend, please join us on Sunday, which is July 29th, mm -hmm. uh, from 10 to 11 a.m. for our Civil War service. And the whole weekend, I think there's Civil War stuff going on. They're so. going to be doing reenactments. The, the uh, community choir is going to be singing in the afternoon on Sunday. So Saturday and Sunday, both are going to be filled with Civil War Day's events. All right. We hope you guys join us. We'll, take, we'll see you next time.